In the history of our country, there is information that has been hidden in darkness for centuries. It is extremely dangerous because it can destroy the usual way of life and cast a shadow on those who were considered writers. It can radically turn the course of history and change the idea of ourselves. Sometimes information simply gets lost in time, but in our case it was being erased purposefully, to keep a secret hidden from us forever. The secret that will change our future. One plus one presents. A film by Akim Halim. Directed by Tetiana Shovkun. Camera Katerina Hutzel. Screenplay by Ruslan Sharipov, written by Volodymyr Omelchenko. Executive producer Stanislav Zhurakov. General producer Akim Halimov. Ukraine regaining its own history. Mysterious manuscripts. Warsaw, 1923. This story begins with a terrible crime committed in Poland a hundred years ago. On February 8, 1923, Metropolitan Georgi Yaroshevsky, a Ukrainian who had recently headed the local Orthodox Church, was working at his residence. He was an exegete. In the church world, these are people who decipher ancient manuscripts. Yaroshevsky was engaged in a project connected with Ukrainian history, and he was waiting for a professor from Kyiv. But that night, another visitor came to his place. Yaroshevsky was killed. Every crime has a motive. We will unravel cases in which the motive is to destroy history. My name is Akim Halimo. Six years ago I assembled a professional team of scientists and we started the project titled Ukraine Regaining Its Own History. Its purpose is to refute historical myths and show the real history of our country. History was deliberately erased from the memory of Ukrainians. The researcher of history, Ruslan Sharipov, helps me. Thanks to his contacts with archives around the world, we have access to unique sources that reveal sensational facts. They became schismatics. Schismatics, yes. They went into schism. This time we have the most complicated case, which concerns the falsification of church history. In fact, 500 years of history were plastered. A powerful enemy hides behind the murder of the clergyman. For centuries it has been building the world based on false history. Someone wanted us to forget this. The truth is a devastating blow for him, and it's encrypted in the mysterious manuscripts of the Church, simply going back to our roots. Mysterious manuscripts. 
who killed the Metropolitan and why. We are launching two lines of investigation. Ruslan goes to Warsaw, where the crime took place, to find out all the circumstances of this mysterious case. And I focus on the historical investigation of Georgi Yaroshevsky. Could this murder be related to the project that the Metropolitan was preparing? If he was killed because of it, then it contained extremely important information for our country. And we must establish what was that about. It's worth starting from the place where the most ancient church manuscripts are kept. This is Kiev Pechersk Lavra. It is known that during the period when Yaroshevsky lived, a book was found there, which became a real sensation among scientists. Today all the old documents are kept in special closed storage. It's impossible for unauthorized persons to get there. So to find the necessary manuscript, I turn to the historian Oksana Prokopiuk. She has been studying the ancient books of this repository for several years and is the best guide in the labyrinth of thousands of unique manuscripts. At my request, the scientist takes out a small velvet box from the vault. A unique thing, the oldest book in this book depository. A book that survived a lot of historical events and survived the great lover fire of 1718. It was discovered in the sacristy of the Dormition Cathedral, and this book drew attention as historical source, a significant landmark. This information is very important. Her Yaroshevsky couldn't have been unaware of the rediscovery of such an ancient manuscript. Mentioner of the Dharmashen Cathedral of the Kifpichers Klavra, a book in which the names of believers were written down for their remembrance in the church. They began to conduct it at the end of 15th century. 15th century? End of 15th century, can you imagine? Is this book half a thousand years old? It is. Names were written down into the memorial book according to the social hierarchical principle. We can see princely families, for example. The names of the secular rules were also included in this book. So in this book we can find all the people who are important for our history. Yes, you see, remember Lord, our great princess. And the first to be recorded here is Prince Vladimir the Great, named in holy baptism Vasily. That is, it is… About the Baptist. About Vladimir the Great, the Baptist of Rus. At first glance, this is a simple commemorative book. But the fact that the names of the rulers and grand dukes of the past were written there turns it into a real encyclopedia by which you can study our history. But suddenly I noticed something extremely strange in it. Look, you see, there is a place as if erased. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed, the mist, or rather not mist, erased, scrapped name of the next ruler. That is, this book has undergone editorial interference. This book was just for official use. Only a limited number of people had access to it. The one who edited understood well what the consequences could be. Back then, history was written by the Church. Today we know about the life and work of such princes as Volodymyr the Great or Yaroslav the Vice, precisely due to Church books. So, if the ruler's name was erased from Church books, or he wasn't mentioned during Divine services, people forgot him over time. So, from that moment, this person seemed to cease to exist for our history. Apparently, this person couldn't continue to be on the pages of the Mentioner. Why? Clearly, this question also needs to be answered. Someone was literally erased from our past. Perhaps the murdered Metropolitan Yaroshevsky knew who that person was. We must decipher the erased fragment, and modern technology makes it possible to do. Oksana Prokopiuk makes a photo of the page with the raised lines in the best quality. This way we can see the smallest details of the inscription.
Thanks to this, we find the places where the ink was, mark them and reproduce the inscription letter by letter in its original form. Yeah. Here it is, done. Let's try to read. Letters appear. It's hard to believe that in a moment we'll see the name of a person who has been unknown for centuries. Prince the Great. Vai? Vai Tauras. I didn't think I'd see Vai Tauras's name among the names of the great Ukrainian princes of the past. In Europe, only one ruler is known by this name, who lived in the 14th century. He ruled the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which included our lands. But why was his name erased from the mentioner of the main Ukrainian shrine? It seems that behind the story of the prince who lived more than half a thousand years ago, there is a big secret, and some unknown force protects it to this day, destroying everyone who approaches the solution. History from the 10th to 15th century, we have very little information, huge white spots that make a mystery out of this history. Ruslan arrives in Warsaw. His goal is to find information about a crime committed here more than a hundred years ago and to get on the trail of the killer. The only place where there can be information on this case is the archive of new acts. In the vaults of this archive, under special supervision, documents of the Polish Republic for 1920s are stored. The data that got here was classified for a long time, because it contained information about the activities of the Polish special services, police and higher authorities. Now that the years of secrecy has expired, some of the secret papers are available to researchers. Our case is about murder, so we need to look in the archives of the Ministry of Internal Affairs among the documents for February 1923, when the crime was committed. 1923. Germans and Belarusian cases, Ukrainian cases. There are hundreds of criminal cases in the catalogues for 1923, but not a single mention of the murder of Yaroshevsky. This is quite odd. Why there is no criminal case on such a high-profile murder in the archives of the Polish Ministry of Internal Affairs? We have faced a big obstacle, and now any information about this crime is important for us. It's necessary to expand our search. Ruslan stays in the archive and will search through all available databases. During my first visit to the Lavra, I didn't know that in a few days I would have to return here again. Upon learning of our investigation, the historian Boris Cherkas contacted me. He had been researching the period of Grand Duchy of Lithuania for many years, the so-called Dark Ages, when Vytautas lived and ruled. This period is the link between the Rus of the Rurik dynasty and the modern history of the Cossack times. Hello, Boris. Good afternoon. He made an appointment to show me something unusual. Please, look here. These are drawings of the foundation of the Dormishin Cathedral in different eras. Dormishin Cathedral is the main church of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra, one of the most sacred churches in our country, built a thousand years ago. This is the contour of the cathedral from the times of Rus. And now we'll take a look at another contour, put it on top, and what do we see? We see that extensions appear around the cathedral. These are extensions to the main building, in which there are tombs. As archaeological studies show, this extension appeared precisely during the reign of the Lithuanian dynasty on Ukrainian lands. This is 14th or 15th century. So you're saying that Lithuanian princes were buried on the territory of Kiev-Pechersk Lavra? Yes. 
This is one of the many mysteries in our history, which few people know yet. First, erase the name of the Lithuanian prince Vaitautas in the ancient book of the Lavra. Now the grace of other Lithuanian princes that were in the Dormition Cathedral and about which nothing was known before. It seems that we are discovering some secret history. Tell me, please, why do we know so little about this? I guess someone wanted us to forget this. And for this, very serious steps were taken, starting with the overwriting of Vaitautas's name in the Kiev Pechersk Mentioner and ending with blowing up of the cathedral itself. Was the cathedral blown up? Yes. In 1941 it was destroyed, totally. So you think that all these things are related? I think this is part of the same process. This goal was to destroy the memory of Ukrainians about the 14th and 15th century. What power could lurk behind such a grand plan to destroy history? And what happened on our lands during the so-called Dark Ages and why was it carefully erased from our memory? It seems that the murder of Metropolitan Yaroshevsky may be just the tip of the iceberg, and every time more and more questions arise. Meanwhile, Ruslan continues to work in the archives in Poland, and finally he succeeds. Searching the entire database of the archive yields a result. We find documents with the name of Yaroshevsky is mentioned. Archive workers prepared materials for Ruslan in a separate room. Pilnataina, top secret. This is a folder from the Polish Ministry of Religion and Education archives. And now it's time to talk more about the murdered Metropolitan. In fact, Georgi Yaroshevsky wasn't a simple church minister. In the past he was known as a respected scholar in the Orthodox world. Once he was head of the St. Petersburg Theological Academy, a higher educational institution of the Russian Orthodox Church. And like no one else he understood the intricacies of history. Yeah, this is some extract from a criminal case. So the criminal case on the murder of Yaroshevsky was opened. Ruslan finds the most important thing – the name of the killer. Criminal case of Smaragd. Who was this priest with a strange name Smaragd? His secular last name is found in the files. It's Latyshenko. It is known that he represented the Russian Orthodox Church and served in the city of Helm, but no more information is available. It's weird that this file contains only a part of the documents from the criminal case. There are no interrogations of witnesses, no testimony of the killer, no conclusions of the investigators here, as if someone cleaned up the main body of data. If the documents have disappeared, newspapers can come to the rescue. Journalists simply couldn't help but write about such a story as the murder of an orthodox metropolitan. Ruslan went to the library of University of Warsaw, where they keep the files of all Polish newspapers. Here he agreed to meet with the historian Andriy Starodub, who has been researching the Polish archives for 20 years. Perhaps together they will be able to find out the details of this mysterious case. In the 1920s the Polish press was an explosion of daily press, not just daily, but there were a bunch of publications that came out twice a day. I tried to find traces of this case because it had an international resonance. The historian selected the newspapers which dealt with the murder and which covered the course of events after it. The case of Smaragd. Let's read it. So many different motives and interests, ecclesiastical, political, national and personal, are entangled in this damned matter, that it's almost impossible to talk about them objectively. In these old newspapers there are reports from the courtroom, direct speech of lawyers and prosecutors, interrogations of witnesses and the murderer himself, Smaragd Latyshenko. Did you manage to find anything clarifying the killer's motives? In fact, there is no single version from the killer himself. 
Each time the prosecutors asked why he committed this crime, Smaragd gave a different answer. He got mixed up in his testimony, and at some point it seemed to the prosecution that he had lost his mind, but a medical examination showed that the killer was mentally healthy. The verdict was passed on September the 27th, 1924. So the case dragged on for a whole year and a half. Yes, although at first it seemed that it would end literally in a matter of weeks. Prolongation of the trial, conflicting testimonies of the killer, lack of a criminal case in the archive. It seems that from the very beginning there was some invisible force behind the case whose purpose was to hide the real motives of the crime and deliberately confuse the tracks. And the killer himself, according to information obtained from the newspaper articles, looked just like a performer and a puppet in somebody else's hands. Judging by the newspaper articles, with the help of his influential friends, he didn't serve his 12 years, but was granted an amnesty. Facts that seemed incomprehensible and unrelated a hundred years ago now fit into a casual relationship. The picture looks like this. In the Kiev Petrus Klavra they found an old church manuscript with the name of the Lithuanian prince erased. This is the sphere of interest of Georgi Yaroshevsky. He is an exegete, a scholar of the church who deciphers riddles in ancient texts. He gets killed by another priest who can't explain his motive. And a few years later, someone blows up the Domitian Cathedral, which is also connected with the history of the Lithuanian princess. This means that something very serious is hidden in this period, and someone purposefully destroys all mention of it. What could happen in mysterious times that passed between Kiev and Rus and the Cossacks? From now on, this becomes the main issue of our investigation. Ruslan lives for Vilnius, the ancient capital of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. He must learn more about the mysteries of this period of our history. I stay in Kyiv to find out who is behind the explosion of the Domitian Cathedral. The explosion took place in 1941. All information about this period is stored in the Museum of the History of the World War II. Historian Andriy Solunets agreed to talk about the circumstances of the explosion. Andriy, hello. Good afternoon. Tell me, who blew up the Domitian Cathedral? There are two theories. The first theory is that the Dormishin Cathedral was blown up by the Nazis. One of the weirdest arguments in favor of the fact that the crime was committed by the Nazis were these photographs. Are these the photos of the Dormishin Cathedral explosion? That's right. I didn't know that this explosion was captured in a photo. These are unique photographs, showing how a thousand-year-old church, the sacred building of our nation, is turning into ruins. Impressive is the accuracy with the author of these photos recorded the explosion. The photographs are numbered and reproduce literally every second of the explosion. Look, it turns out that the Germans clearly knew at what time the explosion would occur, they prepared and even sent a photographer to the left bank to capture this explosion. This piece of evidence is just amazing. But not everything is so simple. The pictures were found not so long ago, in 1995. They were made by officer Paul Litten and found in his family album. The family photo album is the weak point of the theory that claims that Nazis blew up the cathedral. If the officer's task was to photograph the explosion, for example, a photo report, then the photos wouldn't be found in his family photo album, but among the official documents of the German authorities. We also have documents indicating that the Soviet military could have done this. Soviet military. This is an unexpected version. Let's go and see. 
At the time of the explosion, it was already the 43rd day of the occupation of Kyiv by the Nazis. At this time, the Soviet troops were forced out by the Nazis outside the capital and were based far beyond Kharkiv. It is not clear how could they be involved in this explosion. And here we have a very interesting document. This is a report of the engineering support of Kyiv defense for 1941. This document was classified and could be published only recently. And there are some very interesting lines in this document. The engineering department of the 37th Army was entrusted with the task of mining the most important objects in the city. Hundreds of mines exploded with the arrival of German army in the city of Kyiv. On September the 18th, bridges across the Dnieper were blown up. At 2.40 p.m. on the same day, Eugenia Bosch's last chain bridge was blown up. You mean, this document proves that the city was mined by the Soviet troops? Yes, of course. The city was mined by Soviet troops, and we know this from the explosions on Hreshchatek. In their reports, Soviet officers even indicated the names of the objects that they mined. Did you manage to find any mention of the Dormishin Cathedral? Unfortunately, no mention of the Dormishin Cathedral was found, so the question who actually blew it up remains one of the mysteries. There are only two reasons why there is no information about the bombing of the Dolmishin Cathedral in the reports of the Soviet intelligence. Either it wasn't them, or the operation was classified, and perhaps not even related to military operations. We must find the truth. In Vilnius, Ruslan goes to the residence of Grand Dukes of Lithuania. They ruled the state, which once included Ukrainian lands. But first, let's remember what we know about those times. Almost nothing. We remember Kiev and Rus well. Then the Mongols came and devastated our lands. And then the Cossacks appeared out of nowhere. But more than 300 years have passed between these events. Has Ukraine been a wild, scorched field all this time? For an answer, Ruslan turned to historian Eymantas Gudas. Good afternoon, nice to meet you. The historian immediately draws Ruslan's attention to an old map. This is a map of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. We can see all the territories of the state from the Baltic to the Black Sea, so it's huge. Yes, it's huge. It was the largest country in Europe. This medieval country first appeared as a small island around Vilnius. Over time, the Lithuanian princes began to annex neighboring lands. Their influence spread and reached Kiev and Rus destroyed by the Mongols. But here the historian pauses and asks to pay attention to colored buttons. Red castles are state castles, castles of the Grand Duke, the head of state, and blue ones are private castles. These are castles that were built by the local gentry, princely rich families, but not by the monarchs. But look, private castles were mainly on the territory of modern Ukraine, yes, especially in Volhynia. It was the most developed land. I can't believe it. There are dozens of them here. It doesn't look like a scorched land at all. If the local population had money to build fortresses, this indicates that life on our territory wasn't bad at all. Let's take 10 richest families of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. One of them is of Lithuanian origin. One is Polish. And eight out of ten are Ruthenians, those from the territory of Kiev and Rus. They are mostly Ukrainians, because the largest landowners were in Ukraine. It turns out life didn't stop after the Mongol invasion. Moreover, the level of development of our lands was so high that after the unification with the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the culture of our ancestors began to conquer this huge state. Old Ukrainian became the official language there. The Ruthenians, that is Ukrainians, at that time were the successors of Kievan Rus. 
They had a connection with this powerful, highly cultured state. And the Grand Dukes of Lithuania at that time were still pagans. They were a little uneducated in the modern sense. They didn't have a written tradition. And Ukraine even had monasteries, manuscripts, books, icons. There is a story that demonstrates the level of our civilization in those days. When the Lithuanian prince Vladislav Jagello became the king of Poland, he planned to paint one of the cathedrals of Lublin in his honor. Just imagine, he called Ukrainian painters to do this important work. For several centuries, unique frescoes made by our ancestors were kept under a layer of plaster, which was applied much later. But just recently it was taken down. And the world saw this incredible work of art. This is a European cultural heritage site and therefore an important place for the whole Europe. It is included in the list of historical sites. It is one of the seven new wonders of Poland. In the National Geographic Traveler survey it received the award in 2019. This is an important place for historians, art historians, architects and, of course, Christians of the West and East. Due to the erased names and destroyed churches, the history of our lands during the reign of the great Lithuanian princes was little known for a long time. But to whom and with what exactly did it threaten? The scientist directs Ruslan to the Ruthenian neighborhood, a district of Vilnius which was once inhabited by the immigrants from Ukrainian lands. That is where we can find the answers. In the meantime, I continue to investigate the explosion of the Dormition Cathedral. By identifying the organizers, we can understand who is behind the erasure of our history. Until today there were two versions of the bombers, either the Germans or the Soviet military. There isn't enough evidence for both. My search brought me to Rivne. The historian Tetiana Septa works here. She is one of the few scholars who studies in detail and systematically the period of the Nazi occupation of Ukraine. Such an event as the explosion of the Dormition Cathedral couldn't fail to appear in German documents, namely the German police. Do you have these documents? Yes, let's go and see. It seems to me that we are one step away from the solution. Tetiana Septa is now working with the funds of the Rivne Museum of Local Lore. During the World War II, it was the main building of the Nazis in Ukraine. It housed the headquarters of the Reich Commissioner of Ukraine, a Nazi official who administrated the occupied territories. We start the search. Among hundreds of folders with scanned archival documents, Tatiana Septa finds one for November the 3rd, 1941. It was on this day that the Dormition Cathedral exploded. This is a telegram to the Reich Führer SS Heinrich Himmler, specifically about the explosion of the Dormition Cathedral. This telegram was intercepted by British intelligence. So this is a secret document? Yes, it was secret. This is a very important finding. Heinrich Himmler was Hitler's confidant. In Nazi Germany he was responsible for internal security. Himmler only received data of high value and reliability. So this telegram, sent from Ukraine, is our clue. Tiso visited the Lavra and after that had breakfast with the commander of the Wehrmacht at the Palace Hotel. Tiso was the president of the Slovak Republic, an ally of Nazi Germany. Unique footage of Tiso's stay in Kyiv has been preserved. This was the last item on the agenda of his official visit to Ukraine, during which the president visited the graves of Slovak soldiers. A separate item in the official program was a visit to Dormition Cathedral. While Tisa was in Kiev at 2.30 p.m. there was a small explosion in the Lavra. And after that a very large explosion happened, which destroyed the cathedral. At 3 p.m. Tisa left Kiev unharmed with his escort. Was this explosion a complete surprise for the Germans themselves? 
Well, of course, yes. This is a telegram in hot pursuit. The telegram says that the Germans consider this explosion an unsuccessful attempt on the life of President Tiso. Next, it said that the three men who were running away were shot dead by the police. So those who made the explosion were killed. The document refers to the fact that these three unknown people ran out of the dungeon of the Lavra, where the explosives were planted. And now the most important thing, Tatiana Septa found a photo of these people. Now I will find it for you, wait a minute. Unbelievable. Perhaps now we will find out who made this explosion. In Vilnius, Ruslan is heading to the Ruthenian neighborhood to learn who wasn't happy with the real history of the Dark Ages and what caused trouble. Once this street were inhabited by people from Ukrainian lands who wanted to be closer to the center of Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Here, for example, the businessman who had business in the prince's office stopped. It is interesting that now the guides call this quarter Russian, that is, from Russia. Although, in fact, it had nothing to do with Russia. Russian street. This is how the Russians translate it. In Lithuanian this is Ruthenian street, and it means streets of Rus, not Russia. And most important, often neither Russians nor even Lithuanians understand the depth of the problem. What is the difference between Russia and Rus? To learn more about the Ruthenian neighborhood, Ruslan contacted Genute Kirkene, the doctor of science who explores the history of Ukrainian-Lithuanian relations. She made an appointment near an old cathedral. We are standing near the Ruthenian cathedral, which was built at the beginning of the 14th century. And these Ruthenians from the Ukrainian lands prayed here. And these nobles, rich people came here, because it was a center in which all life was in full swing. In this place we seem to be transported in time, and can imagine how our ancestors came here to play, people about whom we know almost nothing. Today this Orthodox cathedral is one of the most ancient sites of Vilnius and the main decoration of the Ruthenian neighborhood. But the historian wants to show us another place, another temple, which is directly related to our investigation. We came to the church, which was built by the son of the Ukrainian land, a native of Volhynia, the city of Ostrovak, Konstantin Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky. Konstantin Ostrowski, yes. He was the great headman of Lithuania. Ostrowski is not a very well-known historical figure in Ukraine. Most people are familiar with his surname from the school history, of course. But it's unlikely that most people can recall anything more than the fact that he was once prince of the city of Ostrog, and here in Lithuania Konstantin Ostrowski is a national hero. He was a very rich man. Most of his private properties were in Ukraine. Ostrovsky was one of the five richest people. He even lent to the princely treasury when the state needed money. In addition, he also held government positions and sat next to the prince at the meetings. The prince even gave Ostrovsky the right to use the red wax. Documents fastened with red wax were obligatory for execution by any state body. This privilege elevated the owner virtually to the monarch. How did Ostrovsky deserve such a status? It turns out he was the commander-in-chief for the troops of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and won the Grand Battle, which changed the course of the history of the world at that time. The echo of this victory sounded throughout Europe. Ostrovsky was compared with such famous ancient commanders as Hannibal, Scipio, Pyrrhus. Whom did Ostrovsky defeat? Perhaps the name of the enemy will explain why one of the most prominent periods in our history was erased.
This battle took place in 1514. In battle, the Allied armies of Lithuania and Poland met against the army of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. That's who the enemy was. But how is this possible? After all, Rus was alone, and we were told about a common history with the Russians. The facts show otherwise. United Europe, led by the Ukrainian commander, was on one front line. Moscow was on the other. In our army there were 30,000 soldiers, and the Muscovites had about 80,000. He won this battle using innovative technology and combat tactics. It turns out that he went into battle with the forces three times smaller than those of the enemy. Of course, almost three times smaller. Ostrovsky became such a legendary figure that he was depicted three times in a painting dedicated to the Battle of Orsha. Thus, the artist emphasized the outstanding contribution of the Ukrainian commander to the victory. But the main thing in this history is the place where Ostrovsky bequeathed to be buried, in the Dvomishin Cathedral of the Kyiv Pechersk Lavra. There was a whole pantheon. Many relatives of Ostrovsky were buried in the Dvomishin Cathedral. Later, a huge gravestone of the prince appeared there. It was installed by his son, Vasil. All the puzzles start to form into one picture. And here is a picture. It was made around the end of December 1941. The photo is terrible. A terrible photo, but it confirms the German telegram that three people were shot dead. There are three in this picture. Do you think that it was these three people who blew up the Domitian Cathedral? Yes, they did. But who were they? They were semi-civilian clothes, let's say. This man wears an army tunic. Another one wears a jacket, but a military tunic is under the jacket. And what does it mean? That these are Soviet saboteurs. And in one of the documents, those who buried them, the monks did it. They described them as Red Army soldiers. One had a spoon sticking out from behind of the top of his boot. Have we established the truth after 80 years? Do I understand how sensational this information is? Yes, yes. This one fact confirms the other. At first glance, the fact that amid the war, the Soviet Union sends a unit of saboteurs to blow up the cathedral to destroy Ukrainian history may seem stupid. But the facts that we learned in Lithuania, especially the story of the burial in the cathedral of Ostrovsky, one of the Moscow's main ideological enemies, make such version more than possible. It explains all the inconsistencies associated with the explosion. If the saboteurs wanted to blow up President Tiso, why of the several places he visited in Kyiv did they choose the most inconvenient for the assassination attempt, the Lavra, which was very well guarded? Why did the explosion happen two hours after Tiso left? And there is one more fact. The explosives were planted under the church long before the occupation of Kyiv, and long before Tiso planned his visit. To Ukraine. As you know, the Germans entered Kyiv on September 19th, and at the beginning of September something was happening in the Lavra. The entrance to the Lavra was closed for some time. Some write that they even resettled people for several days, that no one was allowed into the Lavra under the pretext that there seemed to be the headquarters of the defense of Kyiv, although they were in a completely different place. But if the goal was to destroy the memory of Ostrovsky and the period of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, why didn't the Soviet Union destroy the church in Vilnius during the occupation of Lithuania? The 
I imagined a luxurious, rich interior, but it's half ruins. What happened here? This cathedral suffered the most in the 20th century, when the Bolsheviks came here. So it turns out everything is destroyed here as well. Several wall paintings are all that's left from the Ostrovsky era. Ginuta Kirkene shows a picture of how the Bolsheviks turned an old cathedral with unique history into a research laboratory for building materials. Was there a laboratory instead of an altar with icons? It is written here in Lithuanian. Long live Soviet science. In fact, 500 years of history were plastered. Of course, 500 years of history. The biography of Konstantin Ostrovsky is dangerous for Moscow. He defeated them, destroyed the entire army in the Battle of Orsha. His ability to fight irritated the Russians. Of course, it was annoying. And it's clear that in history they either do not write anything about him at all, or this is said in just a few lines. And the same thing happened with the whole history of Lithuania. And this is still happening with your Ukrainian history. We already planned to put an end to our investigation, but suddenly the case of the destruction of the Ukrainian history was continued. We sent out inquiries about Georgi Yaroshevsky to various scientists. One of them contacted us just now. Historian Mykola Timoshek found information in the special fund of the archive of the highest authorities, which was classified throughout the years of the Soviet Union. I found one unique document, which in my opinion no one has seen yet. Here is a folder from archive files. Here is an interesting document for March the 3rd, 1921. A letter of petition from Simon Petlura, head of the directorate, to the Minister of Confessions. Mr. Minister of Confessions, Ivan Ohienko. The head of the directorate must know who Archbishop Georgi Yaroshevsky is by origin. Very interesting. So, Simon Petlura himself asked about Yaroshevsky. Yes, he did. From the documents we learned that Georgi Yaroshevsky collaborated with the government of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Contact with him was established at the most difficult time for UPR, when the young country had to defend its rights for independence in battles with Russians. After that, Yaroshevsky begins to show an active interest in the history of Ukraine. This means that his research was a personal matter, it was of a state importance. There is a reason to say that, indeed, it was some project not to be disclosed. Minister for Religious Affairs Ivan Ohienko contacted with Yaroshevsky on behalf of the UPR government. Ivan Ohienko is a statesman. He is a person who was at the head, somewhere on the upper floors of building this state, establishing its institutions, in particular humanitarian ones, which were the Ministry of Confessions, the Ministry of Education. Ohienko had always been an authority figure for Simon Petlura, as a well-known informed person, as a well-known professor, rector of the university. He consulted with him very often. They had a warm relationship. Ivan Ohienko contacts Georgi Yaroshevsky two years before his assassination. Why is there so little information about this story? Ohienko's name was forbidden by the Soviet authorities to use in any context – the press, radio, television and the handbook publishing. This is the decree of Glavlit. In other words, Glavlit is the main censorship directorate of the Soviet Union. There was such a strong full-time apparatus under the KGB. Of course, this was the structure that controlled printed production throughout the Soviet Union. Ohienko's name on the list of banned persons meant that his books were banned. All copies were withdrawn from libraries, and his name was subject to strict censorship.
Such secrecy only indicates that the project of the UPR state was extremely important, and the fact that it all started when the fate of the Republic was being decided indicates that this case could change the course of the history. It seems that we have stumbled upon something more important than the destruction of information about the Lithuanian princess. How do we find out about this project? Yaroshevsky was killed, all information about Ohienko was destroyed. If you follow Ohienko's path, it was the territory of Slovakia, a little bit of Germany, and then he lived in Switzerland for more than a year, and then ended up in Canada. In Canada he stayed the longest. He lived there until his 90s. And obviously, there are clues to those stories that you are interested in. I decide to fly to Canada. We need to find information about this secret project, which was headed by Ohienko as the minister of UPR. One of the largest diasporas of Ukrainians in the world lives in Canada today. About a million ethnic Ukrainians live here. Ivan Ohienko arrived here at the end of the World War II and settled in the city of Winnipeg. And here a real metamorphosis took place with him. Overseas, the former Minister for Religious Affairs becomes a clergyman, Metropolitan Hilarion. He heads the Orthodox Church of Canada. There are no direct heirs of Ivan Ohienko in Winnipeg. His closest associates have long been dead. But in Montreal, I still managed to find a person who was personally acquainted with Ivan Ohienko. This is father Igor Kutash, his student. When you talked to him, did he tell you anything about a secret project that he was engaged in back in days of the Ukrainian People's Republic? I know that he studied the history of the Ukrainian Church a lot. I have a unique record of Metropolitan Ilarion, probably from the 1950s. Unbelievable. We can hear first-hand information from a person who lived in the last century. What is it about? This means that the Church in Ukraine is a part of the Universal Church, that is, the Orthodox Church, which was centered in Constantinople. So Ukraine accepted the faith of Christ from there. This means that Ohienko investigated the events of a thousand years ago, the baptism of Rus. But for what purpose, Ihor Kutash doesn't know. According to him, the Metropolitan was talking about a large-scale historical falsification on the part of Moscow, by correcting which Ukraine can gain real independence. Metropolitan Ilarion claimed that the injustice needed to be corrected. But he failed to do so. The Ukrainian People's Republic fell into decay. His associate Georgi Yaroshevsky was killed, and Ohienko himself was forced to leave his homeland and die on the other side of the world. He has been fighting for so many years and everything is against him. He simply couldn't go further against the wind. Against such a storm he was exhausted. We need to find out what large-scale falsification of history Ohienko was talking about and what he was trying to correct. A hundred years ago the truth could change the course of the history of our country, and therefore it is very important today. There are two directions again in our investigation. 
I will continue to work on finding information about Ohienko's activities as a minister for religious affairs. Ruslan will focus on the history of the Ukrainian Church, which Ohienko researched all his life. If he was interested in the baptism of Rus, that's where we should start. Christianity came to our lands from the capital of the Byzantine Empire, the city of Constantinople. This is modern Istanbul. Thanks to Prince Volodymyr the Great, the new religion became the state religion. Then the first head of the church, St. Michael, came to Kyiv from Byzantium. He found the St. Michael's Monastery, on the site of which the St. Michael's Golden Domed Cathedral was later built. However, by a strange coincidence, this church was blown up in Soviet times, like the Dormishin Cathedral. The temple, which today stands in the center of Kyiv, was rebuilt during the time of independence. To understand why the St. Michael's Cathedral was destroyed, Ruslan made an appointment with Vitaly Kloss, the doctor of theological sciences. Father, what did you manage to find? In the course of our research, it was possible to find unique projects for building a government quarter on the site of St. Michael Golden Domed Monastery. Just look at these plans. The Soviet government explained the need to demolish the thousand-year-old monument with the new construction, which was supposed to emphasize the greatness of the Communist Party. The demolition of St. Michael's Cathedral took place in stages. The cathedral itself was demolished by the Odessa Office of Demolition Works. The cathedral was destroyed, but for some reason the quarter didn't appear. Well, it looks really weird. It looks weird. In the archives Vitaly Klos managed to find facts that may indicate the real reason for the destruction of the cathedral. It turns out that before the explosion, a special commission arrived at the church. What kind of commission was it? The commission which consisted of specialists from Leningrad and Moscow. This commission worked for about two months. Two months? What can you do in a cathedral for two months? They were involved in removing mosaics and frescoes from the walls of St. Michael's Golden Domed Monastery. We are talking about unique works of art with a thousand-year history, ancient sacred mosaics, which are associated with a place where the first metropolitan of Orthodox Church lived in our territory and from where Christianity spread to the entire territory of Rus. For the last 80 years, some of these relics have been in Moscow. A mosaic depicting Demetrius of Thessaloniki now adorns the main hall of ancient Rus art in the Tretyakov Gallery. Perhaps this was part of the anti-religious campaign that took place throughout the Soviet Union. But why were the sacred church relics taken to Moscow and not simply destroyed? It seems that these actions were directed exclusively against the history of the Ukrainian Church. Ruslan heads to archives of the Institute of Archaeology, where information about other destroyed cathedral of Ukraine may be stored to find out if there is any connection between these destructions. In the meantime, the search for information about Ohienko activities led me to Odessa. One of the historians I know, Viktor Savchenko, contacted me. His area of interest is the history of special services and secret societies during the time of the Ukrainian People's Republic. He informed me that he had found some facts that could help our case. Hello? What did you find out? In the secret, declassified archives, I managed to find certain information related to the meeting of the government of the UPR directorate in which Ivan Ohienko participated. Most of the meetings were open, but this meeting was classified. The question is why? That day the ministers made an important decision. 
they decided to send a secret mission to Istanbul, Constantinople. To Istanbul, a secret mission, a secret mission to Istanbul. Moreover, almost no one in the directorate, in the government, knew about this mission. This mission was supposed to pass through Odessa and through the Black Sea to Istanbul. Ohienko studied the history of the baptism of Rus, and Christianity came to us from Constantinople. Sending a government mission there couldn't be a coincidence. And the intelligence agencies of almost all countries that had their own interests here immediately became interested in this special case. This means that something very important was being decided. I recall the words of the Canadian priest who said that Ohienko's project was supposed to change the course of history. What is known about the task of this mission? What exactly were they supposed to do in Istanbul? Almost nothing is known about this mission except the name of its head, Alexander Lototsky, a well-known political figure of the time. But the intricacies of this mission are completely hidden. Everything we found is in this envelope. I pass it on to you. The information here is of a great value. Good luck to you. So now we have a clue. It's time to consider all the available facts. The government of Ukrainian Republic sends a mission to Constantinople at its meeting. The people have a super important task, because the intelligence services of many countries begin to follow them. The information in the envelope might shed light on what happened next. Ruslan works in the Institute of Archaeology Archive and studies information about the destroyed temples of Ukraine. A very strange case draws his attention. It concerns another destroyed church, namely the Cathedral of Epiphany. Like Domitian and St. Michael's, it was blown up by the Bolsheviks at about the same time. Many years later, already in the late 1980s, they wanted to build a canteen on this territory, but suddenly, during the landworks, the builders stumbled upon ancient burial places. Archaeologists came to see the place of discovery. Scientists have established that this is part of a large church cemetery. They began excavations and stumbled upon the foundation of the blown-up cathedral. This expedition was cancelled almost immediately. Ruslan found a member of that archaeological expedition. This is Mikhailo Sahedak. He made an appointment at the very same place where the excavation took place. Today it's the territory of the Kyiv Mohila Academy. Why was this cathedral so dangerous to explore? It didn't fit into the context of Russian historiography. The point is that, look, if we, for example, opened this cathedral, we would remember the figures of such hetmans as Petro Konashevich Sahaidachny. Because, as it turned out, Sahaidachny was buried here. Interestingly, during his lifetime, this hetman became famous for his military campaigns. During one of them, he sieged Moscow. Until now, this is a painful moment for Russian historians. These shots were taken in Crimea in April 2014. Immediately after the annexion of the peninsula, the first thing the Russian invaders did was to dismantle the monument to Sahaidachny in Sevastopol. This news was immediately picked up by the Russian propaganda media and described the Hetman almost as an antichrist. Sahaidachny repeatedly went on campaigns against the Moscow Principality, where he burned the churches and killed locals. In truth, Sahaidachny was one of the biggest patrons of the Orthodox Church. It is thanks to Hetman Petro Konashevich Sahaidachny we can say today that we have an Orthodox Church. Sahidachny opened church schools where they promoted the idea of unity of Ukrainians. At the time, it was very important, because our territories were divided between several states. In the late 1980s, archaeologist Mikhailo Sahidak was unable to excavate the ruined church, but all this time he collected information about it. Based on this data, we want to recreate the Cathedral of Epiphany in augmented reality. Look how it appears. Oh, wow. 
Here we can perfectly see both the environment and the landscape. It's really like a time machine. Yes, like a time machine. Just look what beauty the Bolsheviks destroyed in 1930s. This incredible temple was not just a decoration of Podil. It kept such an important memory of our roots, our faith and our heroes. It becomes clear that the temples were blown up for a reason, and all this looks like a purposeful destruction of church history. Having plunged into it, we discovered many little-known personalities and learned many facts that debunk myths and prove the greatness of our history. And this is just the beginning. What other sensational information can the history of the Church reveal? In Odessa, I'm looking through files from the flash drive that our informant provided me. Notes of an external surveillance agent. This is a report from the man who had a special task to follow the Ukrainians sent to Istanbul. It turns out that in the Turkey they were under the round-the-clock surveillance of the Russian special services. The documents describe an incident when members of the Ukrainian mission tried, so to speak, get rid of the trail. The agent and two other standby agents got into the Mercedes and gave chase. Aiming to reach the Constantinople highway and intercept the fugitives. Drive faster! Seeing that the distance isn't shrinking and being afraid of letting the prey go, the AH-106 agent took out his gun and aimed at the tires. It's hard to believe that real events are described here. The scenes resemble shots of an action movie. Several bullets hit the radiator. Mercedes turned sharply, almost tipping over. Of course, for the chase was out of the question. According to the report, the Ukrainians then managed to fight back. But what did they have to do in Istanbul? What governmental task to fulfill so that they became objects of the real hunt? I'm flying to Turkey to find out. We don't have anything solid yet, but everything we learn about Ohienko's project is somehow related to the history of the Church. That is why in Lviv, Ruslan decides to explore the old Church maps. The scientist Vasil Kmet helps him, and it looks like they found something interesting together. Now we have a map of the Sacred Church Atlas. This is year 1517. 1517 is just the era of Konstantin Ostrovsky, yes. During this period, the largest European Orthodox Church is in Kyiv. All the churches of the Ruslands, in particular Moscow, are subordinate to it. Here you can see Magnus Dukatus Moscovia. Yes, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, which is being formed but the center of the metropolis. The center of this structure, as you can see, is the city of Kyiv. But in fact, Kyiv and Moscow are the enemies for several decades in a row. Konstantin Ostrovsky defeated the Moscow army in the Battle of Orsha three years ago. Moscow needs its own church that is not subject to Kyiv. By that time, it even managed to proclaim itself a separate metropolis. But it did it without permission. Wait, you mean Moscow simply broke away from the Kyiv metropolis? This is what happened. Being a part of the Kyiv metropolis gave the Moscow church a connection with the origins of Christianity, because Kyiv was baptized by Constantinople, the church which was founded by the disciple of Jesus Christ, Andrew the Apostle. The Orthodox world, the connection with the Apostolic Church is very important. Having lost it, Moscow lost its legitimacy. So they became schismatics. Schismatics, yes. They went into schism. I can't wrap my head around this information. 
the Moscow Church, which today positions itself as the greatest champion of the Orthodox canons, began its own history by violating one of the main ones. To hide this, they erase the history of the Dark Ages. A very interesting moment in history, and few people know about it. Everyone should know about it. Two hundred years passed, and the Moscovy Tsar begins the development of the empire. But they quickly realize that without sacred roots, they are imposters, and these roots are in Kyiv, and they decide to take them away. On church maps, the Kyiv church disappears, and the Russian Orthodox Church appears, and the territory of Ukraine becomes a part of the Russian Empire for many centuries. And without Kyiv, without Ukraine, Without our history, without our church, there is no connection between Constantinople and Moscow. Yesterday's schismatics could only gain control over our church, which was more ancient and important, with the help of some scam. But what kind of scam? Apparently, Ivan Ohienko knew the answer. Yes, that's what Metropolitan Larion said, that injustice needed to be corrected. In Istanbul, I tried to understand what the task was for the mission sent here from Ukraine at the beginning of the last century. If you imagine Istanbul of those times, it looked like a blanket soon from multicolored pieces. After the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, power in the city was divided into sectors by the winners – British, Italian, French and Greek troops. The city hasn't yet been renamed Istanbul and had an ancient name of Constantinople. The occupation of the Ottoman Empire's capital by foreign troops lasted for five years. Finding information about the Ukrainians who came here during such turbulent times isn't so easy. Since then, everything here has changed dramatically. For help, I turned to Ukrainian diaspora in Istanbul, and Ali Yausenova responded to my request. She's a history researcher and member of Ukrainian cultural community. Ali, hello. Good afternoon. She made an appointment at a hotel in the very center of Istanbul. What do you know about the task of these messengers? We know that these people represented Ukraine, the UPR, here in Turkey, and we know for some time they lived and worked in this hotel. Really? In this place? It's actually a very interesting place, because this hotel was built for Orient Express passengers, and as you can see, some of the interior is the same as it was at the time. And now we can immerse ourselves in the atmosphere in which the representatives of the UPR worked and lived. They were hiding here. Hiding? What were they afraid of? In the building where the representative office of UPR was located, searches were constantly conducted by the occupying French police. Because back then Istanbul was under the occupation of France. Why were the French police, who controlled everything here in Istanbul, interested in the Ukrainians? This mission was of no interest to France. The interest was constantly manifested by the Russians. France and Russia were allies at the time. So it wasn't difficult for the Russians to agree with the French about searches in Ukrainian embassy. Please tell us exactly what they were trying to find, what was the goal of these searches and chases. Now, unfortunately, we can't say what exactly it was, because a lot of time has passed. In fact, no documents have been preserved. I have an impression that we are chasing a ghost. As soon as we get closer to understanding what exactly is behind all this, the secrets appear again, the information is cut off, there is no information. In your opinion, how can we find out what Latotsky's mission was in Istanbul? What exactly was he supposed to do here? Until today only some memories have been preserved, in which we clearly see that the UPR people in Istanbul communicated very closely with the ecumenical patriarchate. This is the institution that governs all the Orthodox churches in the world. 
if some documents have been preserved, perhaps they have been preserved in the archives of the patriarchate. Do you think we should continue our search there? I think so, yes. The history of the Ecumenical or Constantinople Patriarchate has a history of more than one and a half thousand years. Once this church was the spiritual center of Byzantium, a super state that existed from antiquity to the Middle Ages. From it we took Christianity. Our churches and icons all have a Byzantine style. Even Sophia of Kiev, the main shrine of Ukraine, is modeled after Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, the main church of the empire which which, after the capture of Constantinople by the Turks, was turned into mosque. Ecumenical Patriarch is the head of the Church of Constantinople. His residence is in historical district of Istanbul called Fene. It was this place that the Ukrainian mission visited a hundred years ago. I came here with an inquiry about those events, and I was sent to the chief custodian of the Patriarchal Archive. Hello, glad to meet you. Nice to meet you too. We found several documents for your request. I would like to show them to you. Let's go. Only a handful of people can get into the patriarchal archive. Not every historian can get permission to work here. But they made an exception for our project. We are the first researchers from Ukraine who got the exclusive right to work with archival data and filming inside. We are in the main storage of the Patriarchal Archive. Unbelievable, but a hundred years later, here in the books of this archive, there were references to the mission that the government of Ukrainian People's Republic sent here. Those people risked their lives, but made it to their destination. And we're about to find out what their purpose was. Looks like a mysterious manuscript. This is the P65 code with the protocols of the Holy Synod. Here is the record of the meeting dated June 22, 1919. The locum tenens of the patriarchal throne, His Eminence, Metropolitan Dorotheus, at a meeting of the Holy Synod announced the visit of the new ambassador of Ukraine, Mr. Lototsky. Mr. Lototsky expressed his desire to gain independence for the Ukrainian Church. And the recognition of this independence by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. This is unbelievable. They wanted to gain ecclesiastical independence. Exactly. The invention of the UPR government becomes clear. After the collapse of the Russian Empire, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine was still guided from Moscow. And so, the people who came to the temples were under the influence of Russian propaganda. It was hard for our state to survive without an independent Ukrainian Church. The ambassador also submitted a historical study on the ancient connections of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church with the Mother Church, the Church of Constantinople. This information is very important. It explains a lot and reveals many secrets. The Patriarchate of Constantinople faced a difficult issue. On one hand, there is a young state that needs its own independent church, and this is a matter of life and death for it. But on the other hand, the powerful Russian Orthodox Church, which claims that the Kyiv metropolis was one transferred to it in eternal possession. This issue goes back to the 17th century. We are talking about the year 1686, the most important date in our history. 
That's when Constantinople, according to the Russians, made the Ukrainian church a part of the Russian one. Now the Ukrainians asked it to return their spiritual independence. And what was the reaction of the Holy Synod? The Holy and Sacred Synod created a special committee regarding this request. They wanted to investigate this issue, right? Yes. To study the request itself, as well as examine political and church documents. The transfer of a huge metropolis to another church in the 17th century had to be recorded on paper, where the terms, conditions and other rules that governed relations between churches were to be noted. By by strange coincidence, documents for 1686 about the transfer of the Kyiv church to Moscow were not found in the archives of the office. They disappeared. The events of 1686 are replete with mysteries. And today we can finally figure it out only by examining documents from foreign archives. After 1686, Russia completely absorbed Ukraine culturally, spiritually and territorially. And everything that is happening between our countries today is a consequence of those events. We must find this missing document that defined our history for 300 years and see what is written in it. We have two directions to look for. Constantinople had to inform Kyiv and Moscow about such an important event and send official documents there. I sent a request to the Russian State Archive of Ancient Acts, the largest repository of documents in this country. Such an important manuscript must be kept there. In the meantime, Ruslan checks out the second version, in Kyiv documents from the Patriarch, could only be addressed to one person, the Kozak Hetman. They could only be stored in the Hetman's archive. Most of it was destroyed during the period of Ivan Mazepa, when the Russian army attacked at Baturin and burned it down. But Mazepa took the most important documents with him abroad. History tells us that Ivan Mazepa was buried in Romania, in the city of Galati. Ruslan goes there to find out, is there any information left about what interests us. For a long time the burial place of Mazepa was unknown. And only recently historians have established that after his death in Benderi, his body was transported to Galati. As the place of rest for Mazepa, his associates choose the small St. George's church. Ruslan got in touch with Christian Kilderar, the director of the local historical museum, and asked to see this temple. But for some reason the scientist made an appointment in an ordinary residential area. What do you know about St. George's church? We are now at the place where it once stood. Unfortunately, the church no longer exists today. A house was built here, and the church itself was demolished. The church was demolished. It was destroyed in 1962. It's hard to believe. Another temple in which an outstanding personality of our past was buried was destroyed. All this reminds me the demolition of churches in Kyiv. This picture was taken in 1960. After the World War II, there were not enough land for the construction of apartment buildings in the center. A solution was found to save this church and move it from this area at 1,000 feet back from us. So they wanted to move the church to another place. That's right. This decision was rejected due to the soft ground, which couldn't bear the weight of the church. And they simply demolished the temple. The scientist doesn't see any conspiracy theories in this, but for some reason the rest of local ancient churches weren't destroyed during the construction of new district. The church with the burial of Mazepa was the only church that was demolished in communist Romania. And there is another interesting fact. A few months before the demolition, Moscow Patriarch Alexei I visited this country.
Today only one stone from the church of St. George is left in Galati. There are no documents that could be with Mazepa here. Perhaps the abbots of the monastery or the elders collected church archives, some sacred values, loaded them into cars and went to Athos or to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. If we want to find more information, should we look in the Orthodox archives? Exactly. In the meanwhile, I get an answer from the Russian archive. Regarding our request, they have only a letter from the Patriarch to the kings. Nothing is said there about the transfer of the metropolis. But documents were also sent along with this letter. They are not in the archive. This means that we are left with the last chance to search for this mysterious manuscript in all known church archives in Europe. A few days of work and Ruslan managed to find a clue. In Venice, Italy, there were references to a similar document of the Patriarch of Constantinople, and I flew there to check it out. Venice is one of the most beautiful places in Italy, which also has a rich history. Once Venice was a separate state and had a very close relations with Constantinople. Through these channels, Venetian merchants went to the ancient city with their goods and returned from there with a lot of money. Since those times, there are many documents left here that confirm the connection between the cities. Today this heritage is studied by the Hellenic Institute. Here the letter was mentioned, information about which Ruslan found. I made a copy of it. It isn't our manuscript, but it contains something interesting. Ruslan, hi. I made a copy of one letter. I'll show it to you. This is a letter from the Patriarch of Constantinople, Ioanniki, for about the same period, in the middle of 17th century. Look at the Mother of God image. What's so special about it? Do you remember the letter they sent us from Russia, from the Patriarch to the Tsars? Yes. And now look at this Mother of God, who is on this letter. Hey, these two Mothers of God are very similar. That's what I think too. You see, and this image of flowers around, in the same way her hands are spread out as well as Jesus Christ's, you see, it means that most likely these two documents were prepared by one clerk. We need to see who worked with these documents. Historians often leave notes in archives. It's possible that the person who studied this letter knows a little more about the documents of the Patriarchate of Constantinople in Europe. One name occurs more often than others, a historian named Agamemnon Tselikas, some Greek name. Well, this is what we need. We need to look for this historian. My further route leads to Athens. At the beginning of our investigation, we didn't even think that we would have to fly across the ocean and then overcome half of Europe to find out the truth. Here, in the capital of Greece, we managed to find Agamemnon Tselikas. This scholar is one of the best experts on ancient Greek texts. He is the head of the Paleographic Center for the Cultural Fund of the National Bank of Greece. We study various ancient texts, and not only in Greece, but also abroad. I have a book that I'm sure you'll be interested in. We bought it from an individual. In this center, more than a dozen ancient manuscripts were deciphered. Many of those texts describe well-known historical events. But the details that Agamemnon Tselikas finds sometimes change the idea of them. And then historians must take a fresh look at the past.
This is a book with the decisions of the Patriarchate. There is a very important document about the Kiev Church here. Decision of the Council of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople. Hmm. The date is written here. It's June 1686. 1686. I think this is exactly what we are looking for. The center brought this book for the study of Greek writing. No one had any idea about the important historical information this collection of decisions might contain. Here the original text of the decision is contained, the decision the Patriarch of Constantinople took regarding the Ukrainian Church 350 years ago. The scientist is reading out the most important part. This is the key word. This is the content of the decision. It is written here that the Ecumenical Patriarch has the right to consecrate the Metropolitan of Kyiv. But because of communication difficulties, it transferred this right to the Patriarch of Moscow. But it is said that when situation with communication improves, it is necessary to return to the old practice. So, it's only about consecration, the right to consecration. Yes, only about that. At the time, there were a lot of wars and it was simply very difficult to travel from Constantinople to Kyiv. So, this is not about the transfer of the Church for centuries. Of course not. Everything is clearly written here. Moreover, the Metropolitan of Kyiv, who is consecrated, must be elected by local priests, not by the Moscow Patriarchate. When you give someone the permission to perform certain actions, that doesn't mean that you allow them to seize everything and behave there as if they were in charge. As written in the decree of 1686, the ecumenical patriarch remained in charge. As it turned out, a document written three and a half centuries ago can influence the historical future of the whole country. The disclosure of this letter's secret showed that no matter how they hide the truth, it will be revealed. The whole world started talking about Moscow's deception. In 2018, Agamemnon Tselikas translated the manuscript for the Patriarchate of Constantinople. After centuries of unsuccessful attempts to gain spiritual independence, the process of gaining independence was finally launched for the Ukrainian Church. This was what the people needed. They wanted to eventually see an autocephalous Orthodox Church in their own country. You are a large country with a population of many millions. You have the right to your own independent Church. A new generation of Ukrainian diplomats left Kyiv for Istanbul. Just like Oyenko and Lototsky a hundred years ago, they hoped that justice will be restored and Ukraine will receive its own independent church. For the first time in modern history, we were confronted by the Orthodox who were under the influence of Russia. In 2018, you were able to ask for the independence, autocephalous status for your church from the ecumenical patriarchate, and it matters a lot. 
On August the 31st, 2018, bishops of the Church of Constantinople from all over the world come to Fener to discuss the Ukrainian issue. When it becomes known that the topic of the meeting will be Patriarch of Moscow Kirill immediately arrives here. It is evident that Kirill had a goal of disrupting this process in any way. Kirill of Moscow said clearly, we will never recognize this autocephaly, because it deprives them of 500 years of history. At the end of August 2018, I think there was no ready solution. No one knew how it would end, whether the decision would be successful or not, and when it would happen. Despite the wild pressure of Moscow Church, the Ecumenical Patriarch cancels the decision of 1686, because Moscow violated the terms of the agreement. Bartholomew finally said, Thomas will be granted. This decision wasn't accepted in Moscow. The reaction of Moscow Patriarchate was immediate. Russian propaganda did everything possible and impossible to spread lies about Ukraine and thought every possibility of obtaining autocephaly. And one of the most important messages was, this will start a civil war. They were initially convinced that nothing would be granted. They saw previous unsuccessful attempts and they thought that this time it would be the same. Independence of the Ukrainian Church becomes the number one topics in all media, and especially in Russia. Moscow uses all available tools. Vladimir Putin convinced the Security Council. Same as a hundred years ago, Russian special services are joining the activities aimed at discrediting the very idea of the independence of the Ukrainian Church. The richest businessmen close to Putin travel to all Orthodox centers to convince other Orthodox churches not to recognize the independence of Kyiv Church. But ignoring Moscow, Ukraine systematically and calmly moved towards the goal. This isn't an easy process. You must first go through a certain procedure that the Church adheres to. Ukraine faced a real test of unity. To gain independence, the various Orthodox churches had to dissolve themselves and then elect one metropolitan by secret ballot to lead the new church. By year 2018, we had three branches of Orthodoxy. There is the Kyiv Patriarchate, the Moscow Patriarchate and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, to whom the Thomas should be granted. And the Ecumenical Patriarch's position was that Thomas is issued to a single Ukrainian church. But this single church should appear as a single organizational structure. For it to appear, you need a church council. Everything was supposed to happen at the meeting, which is called Unification Council. It was planned within the walls of our main shrine, St. Sophia of Kyiv. The main condition of this negotiation process should be the lack of ambition. On the eve of the Council, the decision on self-dissolution is made by the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. I personally spoke with every bishop and I wrote a letter to Ecumenical Patriarch telling that I, the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church Bishop, as the primate, agree to resign. Priests of the Moscow Patriarchate Church were also invited to the Council. We hoped that there would be many of them, but at last moment only two arrived. We came and read on the tablets, sitting on the chairs, who should be a member of the Council from the three branches of Orthodoxy in Ukraine including the bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. 
who also had to take part, because at one time they wrote letters to the ecumenical patriarch with the request to grant autocephaly to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, as I did in my time. Of course, it's a shame that others from the Moscow Patriarchate didn't come, those who signed the letter. I think that a very strict order has come from Moscow not to go. The largest number of delegates gathers from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kyiv Patriarchate. They made the decision to dissolve themselves at a local council, on the eve of which a bishop's council also took place. Another important decision was made there. The Council of Bishops decided and decreed that they would nominate one delegate, one candidate for the primate of the church. The young metropolitan Epiphanius was elected the only candidate. However, at the Bishop's Council there was a little conflict in that Michael put forward his claim and ambitions to also take part in the elections. These ambitions could threaten the common cause. But when in the first round of voting for the head of the new church, Metropolitan Michael of Lutsk and Volin saw the number of votes he had received, he withdrew his candidacy, realizing the futility of further participation. According to the results of this vote, Metropolitan Epiphanius had 81 votes, Metropolitan Simeon had 56 votes and Metropolitan Michael had 38 votes. According to the voting results, Epiphanius confidently won in the second round. He was elected primate of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. You might think that the Orthodox community of our country has demonstrated an example of true unity, but not everyone accepted the principles of transparency and equality which were renewed by the Ukrainian Church. After gaining independence, Filaret, the head of the no longer existing Orthodox Church of Kyiv Patriarchate, suddenly announced its revival. Very intensively he began to revive what cannot be revived today. And in fact, even the Supreme Court has finally put an end to this issue. But he considered this opportunity to roll back the situation if everything didn't evolve according to his plan. At some stage, Patriarch Filaret ceased to realize that his personal power and his power as a Patriarch are two different things. It seems that at some point the Patriarch's cuckle for Filaret became more important than state interests. Well, it's not only your opinion, but also of many participants of the Council. But it's in the past now. On January the 6th, 2019, from the hands of the ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, Metropolitan Epiphanius received Thomas, a church manuscript that confirms that the Ukrainian Church has become independent. To find out what exactly is written in this historical document, we came to the St. Michael's Cathedral, where, according to an old tradition, the residence of the Metropolitan of Kyiv is located. Here is the original Thomas. It's interesting that today, in the 21st century, such important documents look like medieval manuscripts, and because of this they have some special vibe. Vibe, yes. Yes, you know, some feeling of solemnity. I will read a part of the Thomas for you in Greek. Lipu canonicos autocephalos anexertatos ke autodiikitos. In translation, it reads, we unanimously define and proclaim that the entire Orthodox Church, which is located within the boundaries of the politically formed independent state of Ukraine, should henceforth exist canonically as autocephalous, independent and self-governing. It seems to me that most people perceive Thomas as a document that only affects church life. This document goes beyond the ecclesiastical concept, because it concerns every citizen of Ukraine. 
In general, we can compare the Thomas on granting autocephaly to Ukrainian Orthodox Church with the act of declaring the independence of Ukraine in 1991. These are practically insparable things, because the Ukrainian Church is the spiritual foundation of the Ukrainian state. From what you said, this document can be equated with documents that define entire epochs in history. Now we are regaining our real history, the history of the existence of the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian Church. The Church regains it, and the Ukrainian Church is the Church that respects its new heroes, remembers those who have done a lot in history. This is the canonization of our famous personalities, such as Konstantin Ostrovsky and the Cossacks, Petro Kolnyshevsky and other saints, and new heroes who gave their lives for the will and independence of the Ukrainian state in modern times. St. Michael's Golden Domed Cathedral has become a center of reverence for our new heroes who gave up their lives for each of us. In fact, we are simply returning to our roots. Yes, because the Ukrainian Church has preserved our originality, our identity, the identity of the Ukrainian people for thousands of years. Like any truly great events, we are unlikely to be able to appreciate the importance of Thomas in the coming years. Tectonic shifts on Earth are noticeable from space and in the minds of people only at a distance of several centuries. Once upon a time the Ukrainian Church simply became Russian, and perhaps the most believers didn't even notice this. But three centuries later their descendants were dying from the Holodomor and Russian repressions, and today Ukrainians are dying in the war in the east of their state. Thomas and the revival of spiritual independence is our chance in the future to build a Ukraine that our ancestors dreamed of and in which we would like our children to live. Dear viewers of the Mysterious Manuscripts, Ukraine regaining its own history project. We are happy to take part in this historical film, staying in the Fener, in the residence of the Mother Church in Constantinople, in our home chapel of St. Andrew. Constantinople always behaved like a real mother, not looking for her own without worldly claims and any demands from her children. Your blessed ancestors immediately recognized this mood, and therefore they never perceived belonging to Constantinople as tyranny or as a negative phenomenon in their lives. In the jurisdiction of Constantinople they could use their language in worship and preserve local traditions, which unfortunately didn't happen in the case of attempts by other peoples to penetrate in the internal life of Ukraine, ecclesiastical, linguistic or otherwise. We understand the validity of the opinion by some historians that the autocephaly granted to the local Orthodox Church marks a return to its roots and the real traditions, since the historical memory of the people cannot be erased so easily. Thus, now in Ukraine, free from new influences and interventions, you can inherit what your blessed fathers did in their churchhood and what they received as a valuable gift from Constantinople.